Hello everyone, in this video we're going to talk about cloning and stem cells. So uh, if you look at the title, cloning organisms show that differentiated cells could be reprogrammed and, and ultimately led to the production of stem cells. So what that means is that we talk about cells getting differentiated and getting uh, determined to become a certain type of cell that has a certain structure and function. However, with our um, increased understanding of how bi uh, biotechnology could work, now we can actually reprogram some of the cells that are already differentiated and then produce stem cells on our own. We don't have to use stem cells that was already there. So that, that is the future of science. So let's take a look. So it says right here that uh, w what is a clone? A clone is when you're, you have an organism developed and produced from a single cell, just one cell, um, without meiosis or fertilization. You know that normally if you want to have a new organism, um, or multicellular organism at least, uh, you would have to go through meiosis in order to produce gametes, and the fertilization of the gametes produce a zygote that develop into an entire organism. But cloning doesn't require that. You can just take one somatic cell, um, well, it's, it's, it's more, more difficult than that, but we start with one somatic cell and eventually um, we can make a clone of whatever organism that we decide to clone. Obviously, we haven't cloned people yet, but basically, if you have twins, they're, kind of, they're clones of each other, right? They have the same exact gene, and there's no additional meiosis or fertilization, usually, that, uh, that give you the, the two twins. We're talking about identical twins here, right? They're, they're identical. All right, so the cloned individuals are genetically identical to the parent that donated the single cell, right? So if the parent donates a somatic cell that has um, uh, the nucleus that has the entire genome of the parent, every single cell except the gametes, every single somatic cell in the cloned individual will have the same exact genetic um, the components. Next one, the current interest in organism cloning um, is from the generation of stem cells. So, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, it's less about, it's so exciting to make another sheep that looks exactly like the parent sheep, right? That, that's an experiment that we did um, to show that it's possible. And and you know, the, in the future, and, and right now, some people can clone their dogs that pass away um, so that they can have the same dog that at least have the same genetic um, components. But we can also use technology for cloning to develop stem cells. So next one, the next one. So here are some words that you should know about. The first one is called totipotent. So the, we call it potency. There are different types of potency. What that means is that for different cells, they have different potentials of developing into other types of cells. So totipotent is talking about a cell that can become every single type of cell, right? So this is talking about the embryonic cells within the first couple of cell divisions after fertilization. They're not determined to be mostly anything. They can become whatever part of your body uh, that, that, that it ends up becoming, it can become any type of cell that it wants to become. It can be, you know, any type of cell. Really, it has all the potentials. This is called totipotent. The next one is called pluripotent. So pluripotent is, uh, we're not just having, you know, four, eight, 18, 32 um, embryonic cells. At this point, we actually have a small embryo. And by this point, this small embryo, that's, you know, let's say half a month old, uh, is still going to develop into a full embryo that's going to be born. So the, there are a lot of these embryonic stem cells, so they don't have all the potentials, which means, you know, if you think about yesterday we saw a ball of cells, some part of it is going to become the head part, some part of it is going to become the, the tail part, and those cells originally, at the beginning, they, they're totipotent. But once it's, you know, kind of determined this part of the cells, well, these cells are going to become head, these parts are going to become tail, that's not going to reverse anymore. But these tails could become, you know, the skin cells of the tail, the bone cells of the tail, the, the muscle cells of the tail, nerve cells of the tail. But in the end, they have to be a tail, not a head. Those you will call, those cells, you will call them pluripotent. They still have a ton of potentials, but not as much as totipotent. Okay, I hope that makes sense. If not, please ask me. Um, the next one is called multipotent. So multipotent is one level down. There's still some potentials uh, in, for the cell to become other types of cells, but it's not nearly, uh, it doesn't nearly have as many potentials as the pluripotent or totipotent. 
So this, what we're talking about, um, are adult stem cells. So once the baby is born, or uh, during your development, right, um, you're born and you're however many years old, you will still have adult stem cells that can become certain types of cell, but this is really very limited. Um, this E shouldn't be here. So limited cell types. So for example, we would have um, bone marrows that have stem cells um, that can become certain types of blood cells, but they cannot become skin cells, right? Because they don't, they're now adult stem cells. Their, their potentials are very limited at this point, but they still have potentials. But your skin cell would be called uh, unipotent, uh, I think which means it cannot become any other type of cell at all. It's fully developed, fully committed, um, fully determined, as we would say. Um, yeah, anyway. Next one. Um, so this is a picture kind of showing you how this works. We have totipotent, that's our, our fertilized egg, right? And we have, you know, several, several cell divisions to turn this fertilized egg in a small ball of cells. So these cells would all be totipotent, they have all the potentials. Pluripotent is um, once this small ball of cell becomes a larger ball of cell, uh, even though it's still a ball of cells, because you have so many, so many cells, they can't just become whatever it wants now. It has to, you know, it still has a whole range of possibilities, but it's not as much as the very beginning of the embryo. And then the next one we have multipotent. So here's here are some examples. These Hemato, hematopoietic stem cells uh, will, can become different types of blood cells, and then uh, these stem cells can become <laughs> these other types of cells. All right, and then we have unipotent, like I said. Okay, I got this word right. Unipotent is once you have a cell already, um, already determined, that the cell fate is determined, then the cell is going to become that particular type of cell. There is, there is no term back once determination happens. So here's an experiment to show you uh, the difference between pluripotent and totipotent compared to multipotent, okay? So we want to focus on the left side first. So left side, we have a four-cell uh, frog embryo. So that's only after two uh, cell divisions, um, after the fertilized egg gets, oh, after, after the egg gets fertilized. So if we were to take a cell from this small embryo that's very, undifferentiated yet, and then we do a clone. So how, how we do, do this is that we have this one cell, um, and then we trans, pre, transplant the nucleus of this cell that carries all the genetic information into another uh, carrier cell that is donating the cytoplasm, and then uh, we let this transplanted, you know, cell to become a uh, to develop. And what you observe is that we can, most of these cells can actually develop into tadpoles. So this on the left is an example of, uh, of clone, right? Because we're, we're, not, we're not just using this embryo, we're actually taking the nucleus out, putting it somewhere else, um, and then making another tadpole. So this actually happens a lot. Uh, so what's the difference over here on the right side is that we have a frog cell right here as well, and we take the nucleus out so that we, we're only taking the cytoplasm, but the nucleus that we're putting in this cytoplasm comes from a cell, actually an intestinal cell, uh, from an adult, well, it's not really an adult, but, but a tadpole that's already a tadpole, right? So this cell is already differentiated and is already determined, well, before it was even differentiated, and this nucleus right here, when we um, transplant this nucleus into the donor uh, egg cell, most of these uh, embryos actually stopped developing before the tadpole um, was able to develop, right? So if you think about it, this makes sense because, because the frog embryo, the nucleus, is not differentiated enough, it's not determined enough that it, can, it still has all the potentials, it's totipotent. And then we have right here, we have a, you know, mostly unipotent, but probably a little bit of um, uh, multipotent, but, but pretty much it's, it's unipotent, right? So at this point, uh, this nucleus doesn't have all the potentials anymore, so even if we were to use that um, to try to clone the tadpole, the tadpole, for the most part, are not going uh, to show up, because by this point, 
th this nucleus doesn't have the potentials anymore. So I hope you understand this. Um, so here are just some examples of clones. We have the dolly, uh, the first cloned mammal, and we have copy, oh, it's not copycat, it's carbon, carbon copy. So uh, I think on the left side is, a is, the, is the, the parent, and then on the right side is the clone. So this is really interesting right here, right? They're clones, but as you can clearly see, th these two are calico cats. So as you can clearly see, the pattern of the fur color are not exactly the same. So why is that? Well, they're clones, right? So that means they have the same exact DNA, which is true. Um, so, so what happened here? This is because even if you were to have a clone that have the same exact DNA, because that's how clones work, you're not, most likely you're not going to get the same exact trait and the same personality and the, you know, the same temperament of the organism. Here's the reason. Uh, so, so that's the first one. So, and, and sometimes the clones will show some defects. Here's the reason. The first one is called X chromosome inactivation. I don't know if we talk about that in class or not, but if we didn't, now I'm talking about it. So the X chromosome inactivation means uh, for females, because we, um, we have two copies of the X chromosomes, right? Um, in each one of our cells, or most of our cells, one of the X chromosomes is actually inactivated so that only the other X chromosome will show the trait. So for a female calico cat, like this picture right here, in order to show uh, the orange color, uh, we have to have certain type of X chromosome inactivation. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that some, some other day, but this, that's how it works. So, so what you're seeing right here is that even though the left cat and the right cat both have the same exact DNA, the X inactivation pattern within those cells that produce the fur which, which, which allows the fur to show a certain color, that inactivation pattern in those cells is different. That's why the pattern of the fur of this cat and this cat are different, even though they have the same exact genome. And then um, there are other environmental factors. You, you should know that, uh, and we talk about this, for every single trait, or for most of the traits, the majority of the traits, most, the majority of the traits that, uh, that we observe they're a combination of both the genotype, right, that, that determine for the most part the trait, but then there's a lot of environmental factors that comes into it as well. Um, so for example, your height, right? Obviously a person who's five feet uh, when they're an adult is not going to become seven feet. That, that is really tall, so six feet and a half. Um, even if the environment is really good. But then at the same time, even if your gene is telling you that you can become 6 feet 5 and you're not receiving enough nutrient when you're growing up, you're not going to become 6 feet 5, right? So the human height is a typical example, and, and human weight, is a typical example of both the environment and genes determining the traits together. So when we have clones, um, the traits of the clones are going to be affected by both genetics and in the environment. The third one is epigenetics. Um, so epigenetics, uh, we said, these are, you know, kind of the gene expression uh, that's not really determined by the DNA itself. So it's kind of the gene expression pattern. So, um, so for example, for your DNAs, they have methylation patterns, right? And some of the methylation patterns um, is dependent on the environment. And, and a lot of other factors that we don't even know yet. So the methylation pattern, if you can remember, methylation allows, um, allows the DNA to wrap it around the histone tighter, or, or not as tight, so then transcription and translation can happen. So the methylation pattern affects gene expression, but the methylation pattern is not just dependent on the DNA itself. So even if two clones have this, well, the clone and the parents have the same exact DNA and the same, same genome, they're not necessarily going to have the same methylation pattern, which means for some of the traits, they're not going to be exactly the same. And then there's many more to explore on why exactly a cloned animal is not exactly the same as the parent. Um, a, a very good study that a lot of scientists do is called twin study because identical twins are basically clones. They have the same exact DNA, but as you know, even for identical twins, you know, besides the mutation part that, that they both get, there are many differences in personality and some of the traits that they have. 
even though they all have the same DNA. So these are some of the causes for that. And then um, this is showing you one more time stem cells. Uh, we have, you know, the, the actual stem cells, the, the embryonic stem cells that has all the potentials. And then we have, um, wait, this is, this is the, oh, stem cells can become other stem cells, right, due to cell division. But stem cell can also receive signals to become precursor cells for certain types of cells um, in order for them to differentiate. Uh, this is showing you, again, the difference between embryonic stem cells versus adult, adult stem cells. So as you can see, embryonic stem cell, if we were to culture it in a petri dish um, and then give it a, not, a different environmental factors to allow it to differentiate, it can differentiate into many, many different types of cells. However, for adult stem cells, that's already determined to be a certain type of, um, type of cell, right? So let's say this a cell from the bone marrow, it can only become certain types of blood cells, but it will never become the nerve cell or the liver cell. All right, so here's uh, something new. This is called induced pluripotent stem cells. So if you can remember, pluripotent, we're talking about embryonic stem cells. They have most of the potentials to become whatever it wants. Induced pluripotent stem cells is talking about we can take some adult stem cells and we can kind of make make it go backward and, and, and turn a multipotent stem cell into pluripotent stem cell going backward, right? undifferentiate. So how does that work? Um, uh, a lot of the times we can use retrovirus. Yeah, so it's, well, yeah, we can use retroviruses um, to, to work on this. Uh, or, well, this is a Nobel Prize some, somebody got. So this is how this process works. We have a stem cell, right? It already becomes a precursor cell, and then uh, that's determined to become a certain type of cell, and this becomes the, the skin cell. So what we do is that we use viruses to introduce new genes and new regulatory genes to kind of um, to kind of let this let this unipotent cell right here to go backward to a pluripotent stem cell. So this, this is possible. We also can manipulate, um, let's say, the, the methylation pattern of the DNA in order for it to go back to its you know, earlier stage, pluripotent, all the potentials. Okay? And why is, why is this important? Once we get good enough at doing this, right now this is really expensive, it's really difficult to do. Not a whole lot of people are doing it because you know, it's, it's, it's too difficult and too expensive. However, the future of science, hopefully you're going to become a part of it, is that we can, instead of using embryonic stem cell, which causes a lot of problems and ethical issues, we can use adult um, unipotent or multipotent uh, stem cells and turn it back into the pluripotent stem cells and then use that to fix diseases, right? So let's say a person has um, a mutation in their uh, pancreatic cells and they cannot make insulin the normal way that's diabetes one type of the diabetes and we can use um, we can use this mechanism to produce healthy um, healthy cells so that they these patients can actually make their own insulin so that's a possibility um, but right now it's, it's too expensive to do